an author, director of Genesis Personal Development Center. He writes and speaks on biblical spirituality, wellness, and potential fulfillment, as well as pastoral care and marital spirituality. His popular topics include Lectio Divina, which I didn't know what it was, but Pat told me very <laughs> no, 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 don't take that. No, that's just that's 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 because he's coming back. He said he's giving oh, oh, okay. time and stress management and human development. St. Joseph as a model for masculinity and discipleship. <laughs> and Pope Paul VI, which is his topic tonight. He's also served as a host of EWTN's teaching series. He's published four books on Pope Paul VI, that are 17 overall. He's recorded numerous DVD programs with bishops and theologians. So he has quite a lot to give in his knowledge of the topic at hand. His website is carlaschultz.com. And he will have some books back there for purchase later tonight. The uh, question I asked him when I was sitting at the table was, why Pope Paul the sixth? And he said when he was a very young person, he began to read his documents, encyclicals, his letters, etc. And it just drew him in. So we're anxious to hear about it from you. Thank you. Can you hear me without the microphone? Yes. 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 Okay. If, if you can't, let me know, but I think it'd be easier uh, if I don't use the microphone. <laughs> Good evening. We're going to start with Pope Paul VI's favorite prayer, which is what? The Lord's Prayer. Okay. Pope Paul VI, when he died, was praying the Lord's Prayer. He often reflected on it. A famous theologian, Eve Congar, uh, noted that um, he given various talks on the Lord's Prayer, and you can't beat the Lord's Prayer. And Thomas Merton says that when he teaches novices, whenever they run into his spiritual dryness, Hail Mary and our Father, you can't go wrong, it's the Lord's Prayer. Let's do a Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, in order to have you out of here by 10.30 or so, one last question for six, I can't cover 15 years of pontificating one day. So I'm going to zero in on, on my expertise, uh, and I think something that would be of interest to you, since for God is his, his ambassador, is I'm going to talk about Paul VI and the biblical renewal. Because Paul VI is the Pope that got the biblical renewal really long in the church. And I'm going to share about this because the biblical renewal has been stalled since about 1985. All the subsequent popes since Paul VI, except John Paul I, who wasn't in long enough, have commented how the Vatican II document on Scripture, which is called Dei Verbum, the Word of God, has not been properly implemented. And it's a problem. Pope Francis issued a document called Parallel Release in two and a half years ago on the Feast of St. Jerome, September 30th about a Sunday of the Word of God. How many people know that the third Sunday in ordinary time is the Sunday of the Word of God? No. Never did, not heard of that. See, and, 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 and I mention this because I also want to offer a prayers for Pope Francis because he's doing what he should be doing that people aren't doing. He wrote a beautiful apostolic, a, a moto propio on this designation, the third Sunday in ordinary time. As the Sunday of the Word of God. And if you, I would suggest reading it, because he, he's a pastor. You can read him. Paul VI is a little more difficult. But Francis writes in a very down to earth way. And he said something that is very profound. He says, The Bible can be both bitter and sweet. And this is in uh, the book of the prophet Jeremiah. So 
that we experience the Bible, sometimes it's, it's bitter because we realize we're not living up to it and other people aren't living up to it and we don't like what it says to us, but it's also sweet. So Pope Francis said that he wants the, uh, this not to be just a yearly event, but a year-long event. And people aren't doing it. In our diocese, they're not observing it. And this is a serious matter. And I raise this because you often hear negative things about Francis on the internet and all this kind of stuff. And it bothers me because people aren't reading what he's doing. Biblical scholars will tell you that Francis has been very much promoting the Bible, just like Benedict did. Pope Benedict wrote what's called Werbum Dawn. How many of you have heard of Werbum Dawn? Okay, your father did. It's a magnificent uh, apostolic exhortation on the Bible. When I talk to non-Catholics, and they're telling me, you know, that John told me the Bible, and I say, we've got a pope that wrote a 200-page thing. If you look at the table of contents, it's like three or four pages, and it tells you just about everything you want to know about the Bible, how it applies to this. Uh, Gary mentioned about Lexio Divina, which is one of the topics I speak on. When I first read what Pope Benedict did in two pages, I thought, well, that's okay. I mean, I can't expect him to be an expert on everything. And I'd be more critical because that's my expertise. And I read it again. And I thought he did it much better than you could ever dream of doing it. And it's interesting that Pope Benedict was late on this. This thing was supposed to be out in Lent, uh, Lent or before Easter. And it didn't come out until September 30th, uh, the Feast of St. Jerome. So when a German Pope is late or something, there's a reason. Because he's really taking his time. This document is magnificent and people aren't reading it. So what I'm trying to say, and, I, and I'm encouraging you, because uh, it's always good to go to the source. See, you go to the source and see what see what Francis is really saying. See what John Paul really said. See what they're saying. So go to the source. Now, something Father said in his homily today about <coughs> Jesus the Word. One thing I want you to take home about where Domini is Pope Francis says we should always return to the prologue of John's Gospel, those first 18 verses. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. It's, it's, it's like a symphony, it's a summary of the whole Gospel. John may not even have written, it may have actually been something that came from early Christian tradition that he brought into it. And it's really a summary of the whole Gospel. So my suggestion is when you go home, read these first 18 verses. It's just very beautiful when it says, He came to the world, and the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not accept him. And it's, it's, it's a sentence, it's in the gospel. So that's something that Pope Benedict says we should always return to. And, and it's important because for us Catholics, the primary word of God is not the Bible. It's not. The primary word of God is Jesus. He's the word. He is the communication. It's not the Bible. The Bible is privileged revelation. But Jesus is the Word of God. And each person is a manifestation of that. When I was hungry, you gave me food. And that's who Jesus identifies with. So our definition of the Word of God as Catholics is much broader than Protestants. Orthodox have a similar one to us as well. So, so Jesus is the Word. So what I'm trying to do is build a little that, uh, background to see how, as Catholics, we have all these wonderful documents. We have everything we need to know. And I'm going to introduce you to somebody tonight who I'm going to just, I'm going to say maybe two or three people have ever heard of tonight who's the top dog on this, and you've probably never heard of him. But it's very fitting. So my, and, and something very practical, is, and I just thought of this today, I would like to suggest that before you go to Mass on Sunday, you, you, you pray, prayerfully read all the readings before you go to Mass. How many people already do that? Okay, a lot of you already do that, I thought so. So, starting Thursday or Friday, start reading it. And, and look at how they, they merge together. One of the things that gets overlooked a lot of times is the Psalm. A lot of times the homeless doesn't preach on the Psalm, but the Psalm usually corresponds to the Gospel and the Old Testament reading. So I would suggest that you do this. Now, Paul the of the Gospel, and by the way, the goddess, I first met with the goddess in 1994. I went to the University of Michigan, so I went out in Ann Arbor, and that's where they had their, um, 
their, th their, uh, their, their headquarters at the time. So I, I go back a long way with regards, and I would really welcome feedback when we're done, because what I enjoy about the goddess groups is I never have to worry about dumbing the message down. And, and, and the reason I talk about that is it's been a plague in our culture, and it's a plague in the church, because people, people respond better when they're challenged, and this includes kids too. You know, and I'm, talk, I'm not talking about using academic language, you don't need to get into unnecessary technicalities, you don't need to get into abstractions or anything. But when you dumb things down, and Bishop Barron is talking about this too, you do a disservice to the message, to God, and to the person. So what we want to do, and this is Paul's sixth primary message, is dialogue. And I'm, gonna talk, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of all over the place now because I'm trying to bring everything together. Because right now your diocese is preparing for the Synod on Synodality. I know Sister Kathy Adamski has told me that some of the priests are cooperating, some are not. And they're having messages because Pope Francis, he Pope Francis is a mirror image of Paul VI. They're very similar. Pope Paul VI was really um, criticized, and, I, and I'll, I'll share with you something that happened to him that most people don't know about. But Pope Francis is trying to in, engage in dialogue. Pope Francis is also trying to decentralize the world because that's Catholic teaching. It's subsidiarity doing things at the lowest level, because those people know what's going on. So, and Pope Francis is drawing, and Pope Benedict did, on Paul VI. The reason that Paul VI is essential is because he's kind of like a Pope maker. Paul VI is someone who opened doors, and we need people to open doors in the church. By the way, it was Mary, if, if, if you like this talk, thank Mary, because Mary's one. I did not suggest it's Paul VI. I gave her a list of topics. For Legatus groups, I usually speak on St. Joseph and Lexio Divina, and sometimes uh, men's and women's spirituality and theology of the body. But I don't usually talk on Paul VI because a lot of people don't, aren't that familiar with it. But she says, let's do Paul VI, and I said, great. So I'm grateful to Mary for that. Paul VI in the Bible. First of all, I, I suggested to Mary, I think you got it in the newsletter, about watching that movie, the Paul VI movie. How, have, have any of you watched it? Okay. Um, it's a three hour and 18 minute movie on Paul VI. I would highly recommend it. It's extremely good. The reason to understand Paul VI is, in the words of Pope Francis, he's the Pope of modernity. He's the Pope of modernity, meaning he's the Pope it really had it, he, he was like a Renaissance man. He was formed of a lot of the French theologians who was very influential in his life, the philosophers. And he really had a sense of the modern world, the modern church. And he helped the church emerge out of this post-Reformation defense mentality and to go into, um, ahead into the 21st century. The problem is, that we entered into a dialogue with the world, but then the world went south. So in fairness, it's not just the church's fault that there were problems with Vatican II. The culture, as you know, from the time the, co the council was called in 59, January 59, to when it, commenced, it ended in 65, things had changed quite a bit. So Paul VI was born in 1897, two brothers, an attorney and a doctor, his father was a newspaper publisher. His mother was very active socially. When Paul VI was a young boy, he went to meet Pius X. Pius X knew his father. So we talk about opening doors. It helps to, be, to get a private audience for the Pope. When he went in there, Paul VI had a white, you know, like a communion thing, all white. And the Pope put the little, the scarf, you know, his, his scar book or the, the skull cap on. He says, you look like a little Pope. He says, one day you're going to be Pope. This is what uh, Pius the Tenth, Saint Pius the Tenth, said to him. So Paul VI had that um, had that pedigree, so to speak. Paul VI was simply as a child. He had he was trained by the Jesuits. He studied from home. He did a lot of work with university students. He was really in touch with the young. As a matter of fact, he helped form many of the Italian politicians. At the end of his life, I'm gonna, I'm, because I don't have much time. 
and I, I want to get out of here by 10.30. Uh, uh, at the end of his life, the Prime Minister of Italy, Aldo Moro, was captured by terrorists, kidnapped, and subsequently assassinated. Does any, any of you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. And you know, Paul VI said, we got to pray for Aldo Moro. we got to pray also for the security guards that were killed and all these other people that were affected. Yeah. So this is really tragic. Now, his prayer, and this is what I want uh, to impress on you, his prayer in 1970, Aldo Moro was assassinated. They, they, they killed him, and they put his body in, in the boot of a car. And so it was tragic. Paul VI wrote a letter to them, even though he came under a lot of criticism from the government for doing it, appealing to them, because he was Aldo Moro's mentor. He told uh, Aldo Moro and the Christian Democrats that you don't have to follow everything that Pius XII says as long as it doesn't image on faith and morals. So Pius XII, some of them, it wasn't so much him, but some of the other people didn't like that because they wanted to run, you know, tell these politicians how to run the show. And Paul VI says, no, you have a separate thing. You need to listen, you need to follow your Catholic faith, but you're, you're, not, you're not the Pope, you know, you, you're not the Pope's uh, uh, fetching person, so to speak. So, and this is very important. In one of my books, I have, I, I wrote to the Vatican to get a copy of the speech. Paul VI quoted the psalm. He said, I, he gave the address, um, and the Morrow family was so upset, they didn't even go to the memorial mass for him. It's very sad. And Paul VI was dying. He died in August 6, 1978, Feast of the Transfiguration. And the uh, memorial uh, service was in May of 1978. And he had arthritis. He could barely move. And he went there, and he said to God, he, he did a lament. He says, you did not hearken to our prayer. And when I, sometimes I'll, I'll deal with young kids who have lost someone through suicide or something like that. I'll say, listen, if the Pope can issue a public lament, that gives you license. If the Pope can get upset with God and say it publicly, at, right out of the Psalms, so can we. So to me, this is very powerful. The Pope says, you did not hearken to our prayer. It wasn't disrespectful. But he was just raising the, the voice um, uh, of, of, of sorrow and, and pain for the whole country. That Aldo Moro thing was very difficult for him. Uh, something else that happened to Paul VI, with all the slander in our culture, Paul VI was falsely accused was in, in a Chinese magazine called Il Manier. He was accused of having his sexual, uh, his sexual I'm not even going to give it credence, but you know what I'm talking about. And Paul VI asked his secretary, do you have any money? And Because Paul VI had no other money. He gave his money away. He said, I want you to buy this magazine. And this was the magazine where they, they accused Paul VI of you know what I'm talking about. Well, this is very upsetting to put this magazine saying that Paul VI was this. And uh, Paul VI then asked all the churches in Italy on Sunday got together and prayed for him. It really helped. They all got together and prayed for him. The police confiscated all the magazines, every single one of them, they're gone, and that company was out of business within two or three months. You don't mess with the Pope. So, just like Francis has been uh, slime, Cardinal Bernadine, I'll show you one thing real quickly. Uh, I'll bet you I have a lot of fans of uh, Benedict Rochelle here, correct? Father Benedict Rochelle is great. I was, on, I was one of the last guests on his show, and when I was on his show on to do the Bible, and Paul VI, as a matter of fact, um, he was losing, he was suffering, I don't know if it was dementia, but his mind wasn't totally there, but he still did a great interview. And in fact, I was supposed to talk about Lexio Divina, and he's asking me about Ignatian contemplation to the thing, so I had to kind of shift to it. And he, he was extremely nice, wonderful. He lives, he lived it. And afterwards he did an interview about this the pedophile uh, thing, and they gave him a hard time and then they pulled the plug on his show. But the thing is, I was there right before he did that interview. His mind wasn't there. So what I'm trying to say is, and, our, and Francis has talked about this a lot, you've got to avoid gossip and all, all this innuendos is going on the internet, you know, on, on, on TV and all this stuff. And I, was, I, I knew it. I mean, he, he had trouble remembering my name. And yet they're, they're interviewing him for this magazine and quoting him literally. So something about that, what Paul VI is a great, uh, Fan of the Bible. Here's what he did, and this is going to lead to our second thing, our, our second person I'm going to talk about. When Paul VI came in, 
he promoted, he published a document called The Historical Truth of the Gospels, which, which basically said redaction criticism, which is editorial criticism, which is saying that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are related. So we can understand the literal meaning of the Gospels by seeing how Matthew and Luke diverge from Mark when they share it, or how Matthew and Luke disagree or agree whenever they have this separate source, which we call Q. This document was published in 1964, which enabled the Vatican uh, Council to publish a document and include this material in 1965. So this was a big deal. When Paul VI came into public, several uh, very famous professors were, were suspended, Jesuits. You know, they always like to go after the Jesuits. These Jesuit professors who were world-renowned were accused by another Roman uh, university of being uh, too liberal with the gospel interpretation and so forth. Well, uh, this went on for about a year, and the rector of the Pontifical Biblical Institute said, asked for a meeting with Paul VI, and, he, and he, he told them about the situation of Paul VI, is how do you spell their names? He said, I'll look for information, and boom, Paul VI reinstated them. So Paul VI opened the doors. We now have, in the Catholic Church, the best biblical studies and spiritual resources of anybody. It's amazing, because since the Reformation, we went into a shell, but since Vatican II, and starting before that, now we've got the best, which is why it's such a shame when they're dumbing things down. And I'm going to try to expose you to some of the greater influences, because we've got the best stuff in the world here for us. Now, everybody has to find their own <coughs> equilibrium with this. Not everybody needs to read commentaries and all that. But it's a matter of what, what you feel your own call is. So Paul VI, in 1969, set up what's called the Catholic <coughs> Biblical Federation, which nobody knows about. It's in Germany. And it was designed to promote the Bible at the pastoral level. <coughs> When in 2008, when Benedict called the Synod on the Bible, it was the Catholic Biblical Federation that influenced him to do it. So there are 80 countries, 130 bishops conferences, except for the United States. We're lagging on this, unfortunately. But they endorsed my book on Paul, book on Paul VI because Paul VI started them. They've given me all their articles. And what I've learned through all this, because these people opened the doors for me, is and Paul VI said this, for many of us, some level of study is important with the Bible. Doesn't mean, you know, and you have to find your own level. Now, I, one time I was in church and this woman was sitting there, she's maybe 83, 84, and she's reading the Liturgy of the Hours. And she does it better than I do, okay? I mean, I don't, I don't pray the Liturgy of the Hours, which I should, you know, not that I should, but that's the term of the church. So she's praying the liturgy at ours, and she says she, she says it every morning, but, and she gathers with people. Now, I'm not going to tell her to study the Bible. You just do the liturgy of the hours. Don't listen, you know, forget about what I'm saying. I have nothing to say to you. You're doing the liturgy of the hours. You stay with that. So people always should do what works for them with the Bible. Now, since I don't have a lot of time, I want to put a new thought in your head about somebody named Carlo Maria Martini. How many of you have heard of him? I started something, and you can see it on my website, called the Milan Masters Ministry. Carlo Martini was the Archbishop of Milan once removed after Paul VI was. Paul VI was Archbishop of Milan from 54 to 63. Carlo Martini was it from 1980 to 2002. He was the most prominent biblical scholar in the church. Now, something very practical. He has like 50... 60 books on my so he's been dead since 2012. Four popes have endorsed his work. Pope Francis called him a father to the whole church. Pope John Paul uh, praised him in his book, Gift of Gift and Mystery. He actually he was the only cardinal that he really said, this guy is doing it, because it's Archbishop of Milan. Every month he would meet with the youth and fill the cathedral of Milan and do Lexio Divina with them. And all these books would be published. So these books are basically retreats, um, seminars, <coughs> pastoral letters that he's written. He is 
what it's called. And here's, you know, the guy is supposed to be education, so I got to give you something a little bit. He's what's called a text critic. Now, the reason to know this is a text critic is an expert in the manuscripts that they use to translate the Bible. So it is called lower criticism because if you're not using the right text, then you're not going to get the good translation. To do be a text critic, you have to know all these ancient languages. You have to study the Dead Sea Scrolls. You've got to look at the manuscripts and see where they agree, disagree. It helps you get a sense of the human background of the Bible. So one of the keys to understanding the Bible is to humanize it. And the reason that I, I promote Carlo, Carlo Martini so much is because he, first of all, he's a Jesuit, and they're, and they're good teachers. He has a doctorate in scripture and a doctorate in theology. That's, that's pretty rare. He was on the Pontifical Biblical Commission. He's the only Catholic ever to be on the United Bible Society Committee to establish the Greek New Testament. He taught most of the great biblical scholars after Vatican II. I'm just, these are just part of this thing. But the reason that I, I, I mention him is because he has books on everything from the Lord's Prayer to Mary. He has the best thing on uh, trouble, it's called Troubled Families in the Bible. If you, if you know people having trouble in, uh, in a marriage, his analysis of Job and his wife and Tobit and Anna and their conflict is unbelievable. I mean, it's the best thing I've ever read. It's much better than you would get from most counselors. And what he does is, even though he's an expert, and he'll, he'll tell you what certain Greek word means that open the, the scriptures up to you, even though he does, he knows all that literal, he's not afraid to use his imagination, see? So it helps us. We don't have to worry about this private interpretation, unless you're going out and pushing it on somebody else. He opens the scriptures up to us. So Carlo Maria Martini. Highly recommended. In fact, Paul VI asked him to give the final curio tree in 1978. He was the rector of the Pontifical Biblical Institute, which was at that time the best biblical school, along with um, uh, the Col Biblique in Jerusalem and the Vain in Belgium. He was the rector of the Pontifical Biblical Institute and Gregorian. And he, he gave his final, uh, he gave the curio retreat on the spiritual exercises of the Gospel of Matthew. I, I got a copy of it in Italian. I can't read Italian, so I got to get somebody to translate it for me. But this is good stuff. I mean, you, when you read him, you know he's given card, he's given retreats to cardinals, and in fact, he taught the bishops, the U.S. bishops, how to do Lexio Divina. So one of the books I have is is the transcript of how he's teaching the bishops how to read the Bible. So if the bishops bring him in in here to read the Bible, then you, you think you want to listen to him. So he he helps you to slow down and to pay attention to the words. Very simple things, repetition, underlying words, and to use your imagination, because Ignatian contemplation in, involves that. So he's someone that I would highly recommend. I, brought, I only brought a couple of his books, but I, but I will, uh, if anyone emails me or whatever calls me, I'd be glad to recommend him. He's, he, he taught all these scholars. And when he was in pontifical, he was the professor of textual criticism. And somebody who's a text critic knows that these scribes, you know, like the story of the adulteress, you know, Jesus and adulterous woman, that's probably not original to the Gospel of John. You'll see, this is a common thing. And we, we're, but it's, it's inspired scripture. It's very early. But uh, it, and it, it's misplaced in some manuscripts. It's missing because these scribes didn't like it. See, some of the scribes said, you know, we're, we're punishing people who commit adultery, and Jesus is letting her go. So, you know, these things happen in the church, and somebody who's a text critic sees how these scribes, sometimes, you know, they're worried about what people will, will think. They take things out. A classic thing is, what is Barabbas' first name? Does anybody know? Somebody's going to get it. Barabbas, what's his first name? Pardon? That, that's right. There you go. See, we've got a text critic here. That is in Matthew's Gospel. And you'll see it in brackets because it's missing from a lot of manuscripts. Why? Because these guys didn't, we can't have Jesus having the same name as Barabbas. So, so these, 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 these text critics use logic. What does the name Barabbas mean? 
Son of man. Son of the Father. See, so son of the Father. So Jesus, Son of the Father. So